Now, as you know Christ, would he grant Satan an interview? I mean, his avowed enemy, who'd done so much damage and turned a third of the angels against him. Well, this is the same Jesus who later on was confronted with Nicodemus' request. Nicodemus said, um, Jesus, I would love to talk to you, but I would be very embarrassed to be caught talking to you in public in daylight. Uh, would you be willing to talk to me privately at night? So here's a man saying, I would be most embarrassed to be caught talking to my God in daylight, in public. So God, uh, may I please see you privately after dark? Isn't that incredible? Now some people would have a God who'd say, look, if you're not willing to talk to me in public, you don't get to talk to me at all. No, the Bible says in John that Jesus saw him privately at night. Now, look who, who's gracious there. God did not want this mere creature to be embarrassed talking to him in public. So the same Jesus granted Satan the interview. And Satan begged Jesus to be taken back. And he was so overwhelmed with his request that he wept as he begged. And the fallen angels gathered around him and they all wept, asking to be taken back. Now, would not God always forgive ad infinitum? Or is there a point beyond which it makes no sense, it has no meaning to forgive? Because, you see, Satan was not in legal trouble. If his trouble was only legal, as the most widely held explanation of the plan of salvation explains our predicament, then God could infinitely forgive and say, yes, legally you're forgiven. But no, Jesus then began to weep himself. You know the story. It's in the story of redemption and early writings. And you have to put the two together to get all the details I'm mentioning. Here was Satan and all his angels weeping and begging to be taken back in. As Saul was saying, please, Samuel, I've sinned. Come worship with me. And Christ begins to weep. And he says to Satan and the fallen angels, it's not because we're unwilling to forgive you. That's not the problem. We would be willing to forgive you an infinite number of times. It's just that you're an entirely different person now. And forgiveness would not heal the damage done. You have engaged so long in the rejection of truth, the twisting and the perverting of the truth. Look how Satan had been a past master of twisting the truth. You so long indulged in habits of illogical and irresponsible and rebellious thinking that you have destroyed completely within you this godlike power, the image of God, the power to think and to do, and to weigh evidence, and follow and recognize the truth. And since the only way God will run his universe is through the authority of truth spoken softly in love, and you have lost both the desire and the capacity to respond to truth, there's absolutely nothing we can do. You see, if, if legal forgiveness would get us in, then Satan could have been taken in on his profession of faith and repentance. But sin is not something recorded in a book to be stamped forgiven from time to time. Sin happens in people and progressively, though we're forgiven, we become changed. And finally, we're total scar tissue. Now, where's the evidence that Jesus' diagnosis was right, as in the case of Saul? When Satan heard that he could not be taken back, in fury, he announced his intention to destroy all of God's creation. When Hitler knew he'd lost World War II, you remember, he announced his intention to bring the whole Third Reich down about his ears in destruction. And the world said, he's, he's a maniac. He's mad. And he was, absolutely devoted to destruction, even his own. Is not Satan now totally devoted to destruction? He goes about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. If one of us should start doing that in West Covina, kind people would find somewhere to lock us up to protect everybody else. And someday soon the adversary will be confined. In God's plan, he is, he is restrained, yes, but not confined. And we might raise the question, why? And that, of course, runs through all 66. But did not Satan demonstrate that God's diagnosis was right? When the infinitely merciful one said, crying as he said it, there's no way I can save you because salvation isn't forgiveness, it's healing. 
It's healing the damage done. And there's no way you can be healed because you are totally resistant to the medicine, which is the truth spoken in love. And you've lost both the capacity and the desire to hear the truth. Satan confirmed that the diagnosis was right and he's gone out seeking to destroy all of God's creation ever since. Now this happened to Satan and his angels and it happened to Saul and it happened to Judas and it can happen to us. So now how do you know if you've reached that point? Is this a worrisome thing to go home with? Uh, maybe I've passed the point of no return. What's the best news out of these early books so far? Well, what do you think of the fact that the one who looks within our hearts to see if we've passed the point of no return is so incredibly generous that he'd put uh, Rahab and Gideon and Jephthah and uh, Samson in Hebrews 11? I mean, all he's looking for is honesty and humility and truth in the inner man. And uh, if he can't find it there, then God would be most unwise to let us into the kingdom. If God admits one dishonest cheat into the kingdom, the peace of the hereafter will not be peace and security at all, and the war will go on. It makes sense that God will not admit cheats to the kingdom. It isn't the customs they follow, but whether there's truth in the inner man, a new heart and a right spirit, that's all that really counts. It isn't whether they're forgiven. It's whether this thing has happened and Paul says, among the heathen, and Ellen White says it, there are those who are willing to listen and they'll be in the kingdom, though they know little of theology. And I wonder if we put our primary emphasis on that more, it might have quite an effect on us, because we're so prone to judge by externals, like the fact we don't uh, work from sundown Friday to sundown Saturday. And that's true of the people who crucified Christ. In itself, it doesn't prove a thing. But this truth in the inner man, though, is a problem because how can you read it? Well, the good news is the one who reads it is the infinitely gracious one. He was so incredibly generous that when he looked into Sarah's heart, who laughed, you remember, and when God said, why did you laugh? She says, I didn't laugh. God says, well, I can understand maybe why you laughed. I'll put you in Hebrews 11 anyway. I mean, that's a very generous God. And look at David's record. And God says in the end, you know, you're still a man after my own heart. I hate the things you've done so often. Disgraceful. Nevertheless, you're a man after my own heart.